Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to speak here today and daunting to join the eminent roll call of Romani's lecturers. Of the scientists among them, of whom there have been several, perhaps the most eloquent was the immunologist Peter Medawar. His lecture was entitled Science and Literature, and this is how he began. I hope I shall not be thought ungracious if I say at the outset that nothing on earth would have induced me to attend the kind of lecture you may think I'm going to give. <laughs> well, um, unlike Medawar, I won't deride your judgment in showing up today. Indeed, I'm relieved you weren't all put off by my title, The Limits of Science. It's rather unalluring and vague. But the ambiguity was deliberate because I want to address different kinds of limits. First, I'll scan some horizons in my own field of astronomy, and then, broadening into other fields, I'll ask if there are intrinsic limits to our scientific grasp. Phenomena within the remit of science, which nonetheless transcend human understanding. And then thirdly, I'll speak simply as an anxious member of the human race about more practical concerns the threats and opportunities science presents, and the limitations on how it's applied that are set by politics, prudence, or ethics. Mindful that this is an audience with diverse interests, I shall offer variety rather than detail. And for the more charitable, I hope it'll be a smorgasbord, the less charitable, I fear, a dog's breakfast of topics. <laughs> but let me start with a flashback. One can't stand here in this Sheldonian without recalling Christopher Wren, not only an architect, but Oxford civilian professor of astronomy. And with Boyle, Wilkins, Hooke and others, one of the founders of the Royal Society. Indeed, Wren lectured at the Royal Society's very first meeting. And from the 1660s onward, the Society's fellows met regularly. They peered through newly invented telescopes and microscopes, they dissected weird animals. They heard travelers' tales. They experimented with air pumps, explosions, and poisons. And some meetings were rather gruesome. Samuel Pepys recorded one in his diary where he witnessed a blood transfusion from a sheep to a man. And the man amazingly survived. <laughs> Pepys conversed with him after the operation and found him, I quote, cracked a little in his head though he speaks very reasonably and very well. And he noted that he was a Cambridge graduate. <laughs> no comment on that. But as well as being ingenious and curious, these men were immersed in the practical agenda of their era, improving navigation, exploring the new world, and rebuilding London after the Great Fire. They were inspired by Francis Bacon. They were, in Bacon's phrases, merchants of light, but committed also to the relief of man's estate. Our horizons have hugely expanded since the 17th century. No new continents remain to be discovered. Our Earth no longer offers an open frontier, but seems constricted and crowded, a speck in the immensities of space. But today's scientists have the same motives and enthusiasms as Wren's contemporaries. The curiosity to probe nature's laws, the delight in ingenious devices. Though I have to report that health and safety regulations make Royal Society meetings duller now than they were <laughs> in the 1660s. And the fruits of science have, of course, transformed our lives. We're ever more dependent on elaborate technology, but also more vulnerable to its failures and misuse. Many are anxious that genetics, brain science, and artificial intelligence, for instance, may run away too fast to be handled wisely. And that's why, as I'll argue later, today's scientists should also emulate their 17th century forebears in engaging with society and public affairs. 
By the way, I'm using the word science in a broad sense to encompass technology and engineering. This is not just to save words, but because they are symbiotically linked. Problem solving motivates us all, whether one is an astronomer probing the remote cosmos or an engineer facing a down-to-earth design conundrum. The latter is at least as challenging, a point neatly made by an old cartoon showing two beavers looking up at a hydroelectric dam. One beaver says, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> and I tell my students that the Swedish engineer who invented the zip fastener made a greater intellectual leap than many pure academics ever achieve. Scientists can't now be polymaths. Research is professionalized, arcane, and technical. And there's, as a result, a communication barrier between different specialisms and with the wider public. Darwin, who was, of course, a friend of George Romanes, was the last great scientist whose discoveries could be fully presented in accessible prose, indeed in rather fine literature. I believe, nonetheless, that the essence of today's science can be conveyed without undue distortion in a form sufficiently free of technicalities to be accessible to all. Incidentally, scientists often grumble about the meager public grasp of their subject. But I think they protest too much, too much special pleading. On the contrary, I think it's surprising and gratifying that there's such wide interest in topics as far from everyday concerns as dinosaurs, the beginning of the universe, or alien life. Some people admittedly can't distinguish a proton from a protein, but just as many are ignorant of their nation's history and can't find Korea or Syria on a map. And that is equally sad as any ignorance about science. But it is surely a cultural deprivation not to appreciate the panorama offered by modern cosmology, DNA, and Darwinian evolution. The chain of emergent complexity leading from some still mysterious beginning to atoms, stars, and planets and on our planet to a biosphere containing creatures with brains able to ponder the wonder of it all. And this common understanding should transcend all national differences and all faiths too. Science is a uniquely global culture. Its findings are objective. They can be evaluated by criteria that don't depend on how they were motivated and arrived at. And this universality is especially compelling in astronomy. All humans throughout history have gazed up at the same vault of heaven, but interpreted it in diverse ways. And it's led them to ponder some still open questions. Was there a beginning? Is space infinite? Does alien life exist? And I'd like to devote the next 10 minutes of this talk to the real crescendo of recent discoveries in astronomy. They're indeed remarkable. They're owed primarily to more powerful telescopes in all wave bands, to better sensors for faint radiation, and to space technology. Armchair theorists like myself deserve very little credit, when no wiser than Aristotle was. One thing we've learned is the extraordinary history of atoms, a history that links us to the stars more intimately than the ancients envisaged. We are ashes of long dead stars, where nuclear waste from the fusion power that makes stars shine. It's remarkable to note that each of us contains carbon, oxygen, and iron atoms forged from pristine hydrogen in thousands of ancient stars all over the Milky Way. They were made there, they assembled into our solar system, and they're now part of us. And we've learned since the 1990s something else that makes the night sky far more interesting. Many stars, perhaps even most of them, are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter circle around our own star, the Sun. These planetary systems display a surprising variety. There are some planets as big as Jupiter orbiting so close to their star that their year lasts only two or three days. Some planets are in very eccentric orbits. 
One planet is orbiting a double star, so it would have two suns in its sky. Now, these planets aren't yet actually seen, but their sizes and orbits are inferred from very tiny effects on the motion or on the brightness of their parent stars. But the observations are reliable. We'd really like, though, to image these planets directly. And that's harder. To realize just how hard, suppose an alien astronomer with a powerful telescope was viewing the Earth from, say, 30 light years away, the distance of a nearby star. Our planet would seem, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue dot, very close to a star, our sun, that outshines it by many billions, a firefly next to a searchlight. But by careful measurements, these hypothetical aliens could learn quite a bit about us. They'd see a different shade of blue, depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So they could infer that our Earth had continents and oceans, the length of the day, the seasons, and the climate. Within 20 years, we'll have telescopes in space or on the ground that can make just such measurements of Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars. Do any of these planets harbor life? Could some even be inhabited by beings that we'd recognize as intelligent? Well, even back in the 17th century, John Wilkins and others speculated about a plurality of inhabited worlds. And on this, we are as baffled and uncertain as they were. Indeed, how life got started here on Earth is still a mystery, a challenge to even the most Earth-bound scientist. It could have been inevitable in the conditions prevailing on the young Earth, or for all we know, it could have been a fluke, like shuffling a deck of cards into perfect order. So we can't yet say a priori whether alien life is likely or unlikely, nor decide where it's most promising to search for it. Moreover, even if simple life were widespread, it would be a separate question whether it's likely to evolve into anything intelligent or complex, still less into the more restricted category that we might ourselves recognize as such. So perhaps um, ET doesn't exist. Earth's intricate biosphere may be unique. And that would disappoint, of course, those who are searching for ET, but it would have its upside. It would, would entitle us to be less cosmically modest, because our planet, though tiny, could then be uniquely important. Perhaps even a seed from its life could spread through the entire galaxy. On the other hand, one day some astronomer might discover a signal that's clearly artificial, or even some artifact. I wouldn't hold my breath for success, but it's surely well worth gambling modest resources on such searches. Because even a very boring signal, a list of prime numbers, for instance, or the digits of pi, would carry the momentous message that concepts of logic and physics, if not consciousness, aren't limited to the hardware in human skulls. So we may learn this century whether biological evolution is unique to the pale blue dot in the cosmos that's our home, or whether Darwin's writ runs through a wider universe that teems with life, even with intelligence. But even in the latter case, such intelligence could be qualitatively different from our own. Assemblages of social insects or computers. And of course, there could be a lot more out there than we could ever detect. Absence of evidence wouldn't be evidence of absence. Wittgenstein famously said, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand him. So even if we detected aliens, would the culture gap be unbridgeable? Not necessarily. Any signal would, of course, take decades in transit. There'd never be scope for snappy repartee, as it were. <laughs> but if they had developed advanced technology, they would share with us an understanding not just of maths, but of physics and astronomy. They'd gaze out 
if they had eyes at the same cosmos, they'd trace their origin back as we now can to a still mysterious beginning nearly 14 billion years ago. So I turn now to cosmology. What can we confidently say about how our universe has evolved? A range of interlocking evidence allows us to trace cosmic history back to an era when everything was squeezed hotter and denser than the center of a star. Such inferences are as evidence-based as anything a geologist might tell you about the history of our Earth. We observe fossils of these early eras and can confidently infer how hot and dense things were even just a nanosecond after the Big Bang. At that stage, every particle carried as much energy as can be generated by the huge Large Hadron Collider, the LHC in Geneva. And the entire observable universe would have been squeezed into the size of our present solar system. But as always in science, each advance brings into focus some new questions that couldn't previously have been even posed. For instance, we now ask, why is the universe expanding the way it is? How did it acquire its observed mix of particles and radiation? And the answer to these questions lies even further back. In the brief instance when our universe was hugely more compressed still, and conditions far hotter and denser than we can simulate in the lab. And we consequently lose any firm foothold in experiment and get beyond the consensual understanding which takes us back to a microsecond or a nanosecond. One of my favorite magazine covers showed a sphere with the caption, the universe when it was a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old, actual size. <laughs> and indeed, according to a popular conjecture, the entire volume we could see with our telescopes inflated from a hyperdense blob no bigger than a tennis ball. How can we firm up an extraordinary idea like that. The twin pillars of 20th century physics are Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, and quantum theory. But these haven't yet been meshed together or unified. In most contexts, this doesn't matter because the domains of relevance of these two theories don't overlap. Astronomers can ignore quantum fuzziness when calculating the orbits of planets or stars. Conversely, quantum chemists can safely ignore gravitational attraction between individual atoms, because this force is about 40 powers of 10 feebler than the electric forces between the atoms. But during the ultra-compressed earliest instance after the Big Bang, quantum fluctuations could, as it were, shake the entire universe. And to address the overwhelming question of what banged and why it banged, therefore requires a synthesis or completion of these two great 20th century theories. Einstein's theory is incomplete because it treats space and time as smooth and continuous. We know that any material like this lectern can't be chopped up arbitrarily small. Eventually you get down to discrete atoms. Likewise, it's thought that space itself has a grainy and atomic structure, but on a scale much, much smaller, a trillion, trillion times smaller than atoms, far beyond what we can observe. And what would we expect the nature of this structure to be? According to the front-running idea, superstring theory, every apparent point in our three-dimensional space, if hugely magnified, may actually embody an intricate structure a tightly wound origami in six extra dimensions. So space would actually have 10 dimensions. We're unaware of the extra ones because they're wrapped up tightly. Just as a long hose pipe may look like a line with just one dimension when viewed from a distance, but closer up we realize it extends into three dimensions. A theory that unified cosmos and quantum, if achieved, would complete a unification program that started with Newton and continued through Faraday and Maxwell and their successors. It might even realize the Pythagorean vision of reducing all nature's complexity to geometry. It would firm up our understanding of the early universe. It would also incidentally elucidate 
the discovery recognised by this year's Nobel Prize that a mysterious force is latent even in empty space which pushes galaxies away from each other at an accelerating rate. Because of that acceleration, incidentally, the galaxies we now see will eventually disappear over, as it were, a horizon into a domain that's not observable even in principle. If you're on a ship, you expect the ocean to go way beyond your horizon. Likewise, we suspect that the observable domain that astronomers call the universe, the part within our horizon, could be a tiny part of the aftermath of our Big Bang. That's an inference that most cosmologists would take very seriously. But there are strong, although more controversial, grounds for conjecturing further, for thinking that perhaps our Big Bang may not be the only one. For instance, other space-times could exist alongside ours. Imagine ants crawling around on a large sheet of paper, their two-dimensional universe. They might be unaware of another population of ants on a parallel sheet of paper, a separate two-dimensional universe. One dimension up, there could be another entire universe with three-dimensional space like ours, maybe less than a millimetre away from ours but we'd be oblivious to it if that millimetre was measured in some fourth spatial dimension while we're imprisoned just in three. So, and again I'm being speculative, a further Copernican demotion may loom ahead. Not only are we in just one planetary system among billions, in one galaxy among billions, but we perhaps live in the aftermath of one big bang among many. And a renewed health warning is in order here. Um, although there's compelling evidence for a hot, dense beginning, this so-called multiverse concept is one where we're still groping for the truth, where in the fashion of ancient cartographers, we must still inscribe, here be dragons. <laughs> and it makes some physicists foam with the mouth, I should warn you. <laughs> well, support or refutation for these speculations must await firmer links between the theories of the very large, the cosmos, and the very small, the quantum. But such insights won't have credibility unless buttressed by experiments or observation. And this certainly requires huge and expensive equipment, telescopes or particle accelerators. The LHC is the world's most elaborate scientific instrument. It's generated enthusiastic razzmatazz, but some, of course, query such a big investment in a seemingly recondite science. I'd respond by noting that it's costing the UK about 2% of our overall budget for academic science. And this doesn't seem a disproportionate allocation to a field so challenging and fundamental, and where the UK, incidentally, can expect more than its pro rata share of the action, because we're rather good at this subject. But what is distinctive about this particular branch of science is just that its practitioners worldwide have chosen to pool resources and make a 20-year commitment to a single shared facility. And telescopes are now international facilities as well. These global collaborations to probe nature's fundamental mysteries and push technology to its limits are surely something which our society can take pride in. Let me now move on from my own rather atypical science and venture some more general comments. Odd though it may seem, some of the best understood phenomena are far away in the cosmos. Back in the 17th century, Newton could describe the clockwork of the heavens. Eclipses could be both understood and predicted. Indeed, even in Babylonian times, regularities were discerned and some prediction was possible, even in ignorance of the underlying mechanism. But few other things are so predictable, even when we understand them. For instance, it's still hard to forecast, even a day before, whether those who go to watch an eclipse will encounter clouds or clear skies. And our grasp of some very familiar matters that interest us all, diet and childcare, for instance, is still so meager that expert advice changes from year to year. But that's 
not because of the relative competence of scientists in those different fields, it's because astronomy is far simpler than the biological and human sciences. The smallest insect, with its layer upon layer of intricate structure, is far more complex than a star, where intense heat and compression by gravity preclude any complex chemistry. Incidentally, many sciences, including my own, have been helped hugely by more powerful computers, as well as by advanced instrumentation, especially in fields where you can't do real experiments. In the virtual world inside a computer, astronomers can crash another planet into the Earth to see if that's how our moon might have formed. Meteorologists can simulate, simulate the atmosphere, though chaos theory sets fundamental limits to how well we can ever predict the weather. And brain scientists could even simulate how neurons interact. And just as video games may get more elaborate, as their consoles get more powerful, so as computer power grows, these virtual experiments become more realistic and useful, and a more important part of science. Perhaps I can inject a bit of advice at this stage to the younger members of the audience, any undergraduates or sixth formers here who are thinking of embarking on research. I hope some of you are, and that you're not all going to go into finance instead. Well, you may worry that the easy things have all been done and that you'll have to tackle problems that defeated your predecessors. But that's not true. You don't have to be cleverer than them. You have access to instruments and computer power that they never had. You can explore realms they could never envisage. So choose a subject where things are happening fast, where the experience of the old guys is at a heavy discount. And remember, that there's a range of research styles. Some topics can be tackled by one person working alone. At the other extreme, some demand quasi-industrial teamwork. But most are somewhere in between. They involve collaboration and debate in a small research group. That's what most of us enjoy. And there's another personality difference. Some people aspire to write a pioneering paper, opening up a new field. Others gain more satisfaction from writing a definitive monograph, tidying up and codifying an old field. So you must, tick, you must pick a topic to suit your personality and your preferred style. And another thing, in choosing your problem, don't head straight for the most important one. You should multiply the importance of the problem by the probability that you solve it <laughs> and maximize that product. So don't all swarm into the kind of theoretical physics I mentioned earlier, the unification of cosmos and quantum, even though that's plainly one of the highest intellectual summits we aspire to reach. That unified theory, which we aspire to reach one day, is sometimes incidentally called a theory of everything. But that phrase is hubristic and misleading, because any such theory even if we had it, would be irrelevant to 99% of scientists. Problems in biology and in environmental and human sciences remain unsolved because it's hard to elucidate their complexities, not because we don't understand subatomic physics well enough. Let me expand on this point. The sciences are sometimes likened to different levels of a tall building. Particle physics on the ground floor, then the rest of physics, then chemistry, and so forth, all the way up to psychology and the economists in the penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a corresponding hierarchy of complexity, atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, and so forth. But my point is that the analogy of the building is not a good one. The higher level sciences dealing with complex systems aren't imperiled by insecure foundations, as a building is. That's because each science has its own distinct concepts and explanations. For instance, mathematicians trying to understand why flows go turbulent and why waves break, they don't care that water is H2O, they treat the fluid as a continuum. And an albatross returns predictably to its nest after wandering 10,000 miles in the Southern Ocean but this is not the same kind of prediction as astronomers make of celestial orbits and eclipses. Everything, however complicated, breaking waves, 
migrating birds and tropical forests is made of atoms and obeys the basic equations of quantum physics, Schrodinger's equation. But even if those equations could be solved for immense aggregates of atoms, they wouldn't offer the enlightenment that scientists seek. Reductionism is true in a sense, but it's seldom true in a useful sense. Each science has its own autonomous concept and laws. To take just one example, the best explanation of what's happening on a computer screen is in terms of software, not a bottom-up description of the forces on all the electrons in the system. In any science, the path towards a consensual understanding is often winding, with many blind alleys being explored before getting to it. Sometimes a maverick is vindicated, and we all enjoy seeing this happen. But such instances are rarer than is commonly supposed, and perhaps rarer than you'd infer from reading the popular press. Sometimes a prior consensus is overturned, though Thomas Kuhn's famous book on scientific revolutions, I think, exaggerates how often this happens. Copernican cosmology, overthrowing the concept of a geocentric cosmos, would qualify as a genuine revolution, so perhaps with quantum theory. But most advances transcend and generalize the concepts that went before, rather than contradicting them. For instance, Einstein didn't overthrow Newton. He transcended Newton, giving us a new perspective, offering broader scope and deeper insights. By the way, if neutrinos really did travel faster than light, and that's been in the newspapers in the last couple of weeks, it might trigger a real revolution. And that would be wonderful news. But extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that's why most experts are deeply skeptical of this recent much-hyped claim. It's probably the subject of wide debate, a debate that's constructive because everyone plays by the same evidence-based rules and wants to sort things out. In contrast, incidentally, I've never found it fruitful to debate either astrologers or creationists because they don't adopt the same rules. Many crucial aspects of nature are still perplexing, but we should strive hard for a better understanding and not let a craving for quick answers to drive us towards the illusory comfort and reassurance that those pseudosciences can offer. Most scientists of my vintage would find, as I do, that the issues that were controversial in their student days have been settled. We're now addressing questions that couldn't then have been posed. And our successors, in turn, will address questions that we can't yet even formulate. Donald Rumsfeld's famous unknown unknowns. And what a pity, incidentally, that Rumsfeld did not stick to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to pose the question regarding unknown unknowns. Is science really an unending quest? Or will we perhaps, far down the line, encounter limits, hit the buffers? This could happen for two reasons. Obviously, some topics get cleaned up and codified, atomic physics, for instance, and researchers then move on towards new horizons. But maybe we should be open-minded about the obverse possibility, that we hit the buffers because our brains don't have enough conceptual grasp. Einstein averred that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. He was right to be astonished because our brains evolved to cope with the life of our remote ancestors on the African savanna, and it's amazing that they can comprehend so much of the counterintuitive microworld of atoms and phenomena billions of light years away. Nonetheless, and here I'm sticking my neck out a bit, there may be some aspects of reality which are intrinsically beyond us, in that their comprehension would require some post-human intellect, just as quantum theory was beyond the first primates. In his provocative recent book, The Beginning of Infinity, David Deutsch derides me for this view by claiming that any physical process is in principle computable. Maybe that's the case, but computability isn't the same as being conceptually graspable, and that's where I think we may run into a limit. But rather than get enmeshed further in philosophy, let's now home in towards the here and now. I'm sometimes asked, do astronomers because of their avocation, think about life differently. 
Well, from my life spent amongst them, I can confirm that contemplation of huge expanses of space and time doesn't make them any more serene in everyday life. <laughs> but I would like to highlight more seriously one difference. We are, I think, more mindful than most of the immense future that lies ahead. The stupendous time spans of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture, albeit not in some creationist circles. But most educated people, fully aware that our biosphere is the outcome of several billion years of Darwinian evolution, still somehow think that we humans are the end point, the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that hardly seems credible to any astronomer. Astronomers know that our sun formed four and a half billion years ago, but they also know that it's got six billion years more before the fuel runs out. It'll then flare up, engulfing the inner planets. And even after that, the expanding universe will continue, perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> so, any creature witnessing the sun's demise won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug. Post-human evolution, here on Earth or far beyond, could be as prolonged as the Darwinian evolution that's led to us, and even more wonderful. Darwin himself realized, I quote, that no living species will preserve its unaltered likeness for a distant futurity. Moreover, evolution in future will proceed far more rapidly than in the past, driven by technology and not by natural selection. Indeed, if one day there are communities living in space, they'd surely wish to use the resources of genetics to adapt their offspring to an alien environment. And we Earthlings would surely wish them good luck, whatever ethical constraints we'd want to impose on such techniques down here on Earth. So the post-human era could begin within a few centuries. And indeed, whether the really long-range future lies with organic post-humans or with intelligent machines is a matter for debate. We're all familiar with the picture of our planet from space, Earth's delicate biosphere contrasting with the sterile moonscape where the astronauts left their footprints. We've had these images for a bit more than 40 years. They're iconic for environmentalists. But based on that, let me offer a cosmic vignette. Suppose that hypothetical aliens had been watching the Earth for its entire history. What would they have seen? Over nearly all that immense time, four and a half billion years, its surface would have altered very gradually. The continents drifted, the ice cover waxed and waned, successive species emerged, evolved and became extinct. But then, in just a tiny sliver of Earth's history, the last one millionth part, a few thousand years, the patterns of vegetation started to alter much faster than before. This signaled the start of agriculture, and the pace of change accelerated as human populations rose. Then came even faster changes. Within 50 years, little more than one hundredth of a millionth of the Earth's age, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere began to rise anomalously fast. The planet became an intense emitter of radio waves, the total output from all TVs, cell phones, and radars. And something else unprecedented happened. Small projectiles launched from the planet's surface escaped the biosphere completely. Some propelled into orbits around the Earth, some journeying to the moon and planets. Well, if they understood astrophysics, these hypothetical aliens could have predicted that our biosphere would face doom in a few billion years when the sun flares up and dies. But could they have predicted this unprecedented runaway fever less than halfway through the Earth's life? And what might they see if they watch for another century? Will this spasm be followed by silence? Will sustainable stability ensue? And will more projectiles leave the Earth to establish oases of life elsewhere? Well, Earth's lifespan is more than 100 million centuries, but this century, where all this is happening, is special. It's the first in our planet's history where one species, ours, 
has Earth's future in its hands and could jeopardize life's immense potential. We've entered a geological era that some call the Anthropocene. And this leads me to my final theme, hopes and fears for the coming decades, the scope and limits of science-driven changes. The Anthropocene began with the advent of thermonuclear weapons and the threat of global nuclear annihilation involving tens of thousands of bombs has been in abeyance since the Cold War ended. But later in the century, a global political realignment could lead to a standoff between new superpowers that could be handled less well or less luckily than the Cuba crisis was. And in the meantime, there's more risk than ever, of course, of smaller nuclear arsenals being used in a regional context, or even by terrorists. But looking ahead in this century, devastation could arise insidiously rather than suddenly through unsustainable pressure on energy supplies, food, water, and other natural resources. Indeed, these pressures are the prime threats without enemies that confront us. And the higher the population becomes, of course, the more serious they'll become, especially if the developing world, where most of the growth will be, narrows its gap with the developed world in its per capita consum consum consumption, as, of course, we hope will happen. By 2050, the world's population is projected to reach 9 billion. It's now 7 billion. There's actually a year or two's uncertainty in when this milestone is passed, but the UN officially marked it this week. <clears throat> but whether the rising trend continues beyond 2050 will depend on what people in their teens and 20s decide about the number and spacing of their children. And, of course, hundreds of millions of women are denied such a choice. And enhancing the life chances of the world's poorest people by providing clean water, primary education, and other basics should be a humanitarian imperative, and it's a readily achievable one. But it's also a precondition for achieving, especially in Africa, the demographic transition that's already occurred elsewhere. Humankind's collective footprint is growing fast. We now appropriate around 40% of the world's biomass. And this ecological shock could irreversibly degrade our environment, leading to extinctions. And this trend is aggravated by climate change. Biodiversity is often proclaimed as a crucial component of human well-being and economic growth. It manifestly is. We're clearly harmed if fish stocks dwindle to extinction. There are plants in the rainforest whose gene pool might be useful to us. But for many environmentalists, these instrumental and anthropocentric arguments aren't the only compelling ones. For them, preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us humans. Well, despite these concerns about pressures on resources, modern engineering and agriculture could provide food and energy for nine billion by mid-century and avert irreversible degradation and other advances, especially in healthcare and information technology, offer grounds for being techno-optimists. I'm certainly a techno-optimist, but one can't be so optimistic about nations achieving the cooperation that's needed if these benefits are to be shared by the developing world. Moreover, these technologies have a downside. The same ones that promise so much open up new vulnerabilities. For instance, Global society depends on elaborate networks. Electricity grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, and so forth. And unless these are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare, breakdowns cascading through the system. And the threat is terror as well as error. Concern about cyber attacks by criminals or hostile nations is rising sharply. And synthetic biology, likewise, which offers huge potential for medicine and agriculture, also could facilitate bioterror. And incidentally, we're kidding ourselves if we think that those with technical expertise will all be balanced and rational. Expertise can be allied with fanaticism, not just the traditional fundamentalism that we're so mindful of today, but that exemplified by some new age cults, extreme echo freaks, violent animal rights campaigners, and the like. 
and there will be individual weirdos with the mindset of those who now unleash computer viruses. The global village will have its village idiots, and their idiocies can have global range. The huge empowerment of individuals or small groups by fast developing technologies does present novel hazards. Incidentally, it's a mismatch between public perception of different risks and their actual seriousness. We fret unduly about things like carcinogens in food and low level radiation, but we are in denial about high consequence events natural or man-made, that may be improbable, but where even one occurrence could be too many. The technologies that I've mentioned are those that already exist. But what about transformational new ones that could emerge later this century? Scientific forecasters have a dismal record. One of my predecessors as Astronomer Royal said space travel was utter bilge and few in the mid-20th century envisage the transformative impact of the silicon chip or the double helix. So, looking 50 years ahead, we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to what may now seem science fiction. And incidentally, I tell my students it's better to read good science fiction than second-rate science. It's more entertaining and no more likely to be wrong. <laughs> But, although we can't make forecasts, one thing can be predicted confidently. The gulf between what science enables us to do and what applications it's prudent or ethical or economic actually to do will get even wider than it already is. For example, human nature and human character have changed little for millennia. Before long, however, new cognition-enhancing drugs, genetics and cyborg techniques may alter human beings themselves in new ways. And that's something qualitatively new and disquieting, because it could portend more fundamental forms of inequality if these options were only open to a privileged few. And we are living longer. Ongoing research into the genetics of aging may explain why. Indeed, a real wild card in population projections is that future generations could achieve a really substantial enhancement in lifespan. This is still speculation. Mainstream researchers are cautious about the prospects of improvements that are more than incremental. But such caution hasn't stopped some Americans worried that they will die before this nirvana is reached from bequeathing their bodies to be frozen, hoping that some future generations will bother to resurrect them <laughs> or, down, or download their brains into a computer. Uh, for my part, as I've told some such people, I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than a Californian refrigerator. <laughs> and what about robotics? Even back in the 1990s, IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. But robots can't yet recognize and move the pieces on a real chessboard as adeptly as a child can. Later this century, though, their more advanced successes may relate to their surroundings and to people as adeptly as we do. And moral questions then arise of a kind which I suspect George Romanes would have worried about, because George Romanes wrote a book on animal intelligence, and he rather overestimated the likely intelligent feelings. He even thought that ants had emotions, and etc. So he would worry about the moral questions that would arise if we had advanced computers. We accept an obligation to ensure that other human beings, and indeed some animal species, can fulfill their natural potential. So what's our obligation towards sophisticated robots? Should we feel guilty about exploiting them? Should we fret if they're underemployed, frustrated, or bored? George Romanes probably would, and we have to decide whether we agree with him. Well, these are problems for the conjectural future, but already, Possible applications of science confront us with hard choices. To take a few at random, who should access the readout from our genetic code? How will longer lifespans affect society? Should we build nuclear power stations or wind farms to keep the lights on? Should we plant GM crops? Should the law allow designer babies? How can we best help Africa towards a more prosperous future? None of these issues is purely scientific. They've got a scientific dimension, but they also involve ethics, economics, and social policies. 
So the second reason, apart from the cultural one I mentioned at the beginning, why scientific literacy is important, is to ensure that public discussion of such issues can be broad, that it can rise above tabloid slogans. In domains beyond their special expertise, scientists have no enhanced authority, and they have a wide range of political and social perspectives. But I think despite that, as scientific citizens, they have a special obligation to engage, for instance, by involvement with NGOs or campaigning groups, by blogging or journalism, or through political activity. You'd be a poor parent if you didn't care about what happened to your children in adulthood, even though you may have little control about it. Likewise, scientists, whatever their expertise, shouldn't be indifferent to the fruits of their ideas, their creations. They should try to foster benign spin-offs, commercial or otherwise, and they should resist as far as they can dubious or threatening applications of their work and alert the public and politicians to perceived dangers. But they shouldn't be bashful in proclaiming that despite the challenges, there seems no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world where all enjoy a lifestyle better than we in the West do today. Above all, they should urge greater priority for long-term global issues on the political agenda, where the urgent all too often trumps the important. I'll conclude with a personal perspective on this theme, triggered when I visit the greatest building near where I live in Cambridge, Ely Cathedral. Ely Cathedral overwhelms us today, but think of its impact 900 years ago. Think of the vast enterprise its construction entailed. Most of its builders had never traveled more than 50 miles. The Fens were their world. Even the most educated knew of nothing beyond Europe. They thought the world was a few thousand years old, and that it might not last another thousand. But despite these constricted horizons in both time and space, despite the deprivation and harshness of their lives, Despite their primitive technology and meager resources, they built this cathedral, pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Those who conceived it knew they wouldn't live to see it finished, and their legacy still elevates our spirits nearly a millennium later. What a contrast to so much of our discourse today. Unlike our forebears, we know a great deal about our world, and indeed about what lies beyond. Technologies that our ancestors couldn't have conceived enrich our lives and our understanding. Many things still make us fearful, but the advance of science spares us from irrational dread. We know that we are stewards of a precious pale blue dot in a vast cosmos, a planet with a future measured in millions of years, whose fate depends on humanity's collective actions. But all too often, the focus is parochial and short term. We downplay what's happening even now in impoverished faraway countries. And we discount too heavily the problems we leave for our grandchildren. In today's runaway world, we can't aspire to leave a monument lasting a thousand years, but it would surely be shameful if we denied future generations a fair inheritance. To survive this century, we need the idealistic and effective efforts of natural scientists, environmentalists, social scientists, and humanists. They must be guided by the best evidence, but inspired by values from beyond the limits of science. Well, I started by quoting Medawar. I'd like to give him the last word, too. This quote is from his BBC Reith Lectures in 1959, but the message is more urgent today. I quote, The bells that toll for mankind are, most of them anyway, like the bells on alpine cattle. They are attached to our own necks. And it must be our fault if they do not make a cheerful and harmonious sound.